Quick, which one of these buttons do you think would get more people to browse your in-app store? Are you sure? Would you bet your entire company's future on it? Because, you know, you're kind of doing that every day when you make decisions like this. So let's find out how to make sure you're making the most informed decisions with a little help from A-B testing from Firebase. Okay, so what is A-B testing and why should you care? I may have been a little overdramatic in our intro, but you do make lots of decisions every day about your app, whether it's the look and feel of a button, the text that's designed to get people to try out a new feature, how often you show ads, or how challenging you make level 12 in your game. And while individually these changes might seem small, together they can have a big impact on your app's success, often meaning the difference between a killer app that feels just right versus a mediocre app that never really gains traction. But how do you know you're making the right changes? I mean, you're probably a little too vested in your own app to see it from the perspective of a typical user. And sure, you could ask your friends, your family, or various focus groups, but that can be kind of inefficient, and you're usually dealing with small and probably biased sample sizes. Sorry, Mom. Also, frankly, sometimes what people say they're going to do within your app doesn't actually match up with how they really behave. So another option is to make a change in your app, publish it to the world, wait a couple of weeks, and see if your users behave any differently. So this can work, but it's also time consuming if you wanted to, say, test three or four variations. I mean, assuming you want a couple of weeks to try out each change, that could be like two months spent just trying out those variations. But more importantly, how do you know the change in behavior you're seeing really resulted from the change you made in your app? I mean, maybe you ran a different ad campaign that week that brought in a different set of users with different characteristics. Maybe your app got a mention in a blog post that brought in a whole new set of users. Or maybe the weather was just super nice that week and people decided to spend time outdoors and not on their phones. It can happen. And so that's where A-B tests come in. The idea behind an A-B test is that you take a subset of your users, uh, usually not all of them, and break them up into randomly assigned groups. Then each one of these groups sees a slightly different version of your app, and you can measure how your users interact with your app in each one of these different groups. Since these different groups are all using your app at the same time, any external change, like a particularly sunny day, will affect all of your users equally. So if there's a noticeable change between the groups, you can be pretty confident the change in the behavior that you're seeing is due to the change within your app and not like some external factor. Now, Firebase recently made some major improvements to their A-B testing framework. First, they added a whole bunch of enhancements up front to make it easier for you to get started with an A-B test. And then they added a whole lot of fancy math under the hood to help you measure the results and let you know that if these results you're seeing are truly meaningful. And we're going to show you how to get your app up and running with A-B tests on this new system over the course of the next few videos. Now, the first two touch points that the team has opened up to A-B testing are Firebase notifications and Firebase remote config. Notifications are great for testing, well, notifications, and remote config is good for testing just about anything else that happens within your app. So we're going to focus on remote config initially in our video series, but we will touch on notifications in a future video. So the first thing you're going to need to do if you want to run a good A-B test is wire up your app to use remote config. Now, if you're not familiar with remote config, you can kind of think of it like a key value store that lives in the cloud. Your app can download this data and change its behavior based on the values that you've specified here. Now, we've already got some pretty good screencasts on how to get started with remote config, both for Android and iOS. So if you've never used remote config before, I recommend you check these out, and you can find links to them in the description below. If you are somewhat familiar with remote config, you might remember that the process works a little like this. First, you supply remote config with a bunch of default values. Then, usually when your user starts up your app, the remote config service will go out onto the internet, grab any new values that you've defined from the Firebase console, and apply these new values on top of your old defaults. Then, when you query remote config for particular values, it will either give you an updated value that you've uh, specified from the cloud, if one exists, or a default value if it doesn't. And so the strategy we generally recommend is to take any value you might want to change, right? Like every bit of text, every color, every game balancing variable, and wire them up to use remote config. Remember, because you're only downloading the values that you've changed, the actual network calls you make will still be nice and small, but you still have the freedom to change any value you might want later. This does mean that for maximum A-B testing effectiveness, you'll probably want to spend a little more time setting your UI elements by code instead of relying on what you set within Xcode storyboards or your Android layout files. It does seem like many large organizations prefer to do this anyway, because dealing with Git merges is usually easier with like code than with a generated XML file. But it turns out it also makes everything a little more remote config friendly too. And as far as localization goes, you should still be fine. 
Remember, you're defining your default values through code or through a plist or resource file. So you can go ahead and continue to use your localization friendly code to set these default strings or make sure that this external file is among the resources that get sent off for translation. Either way, you'll end up with default strings that are properly localized at runtime for your current location. Uh, incidentally, since you are going to end up with a slew of different keys for like every constant you're defining within your app, I do recommend making sure you use something like an enum or a bunch of static constants to reference these keys. Don't rely on like hand type strings because one typo could really throw you off. And also you want to make sure you can use your IDE's auto completion to help you out here. But you probably already knew that. So let's take a look at my sample app here. Uh, this here is my front page. Isn't it lovely? And uh, I've added in this little slide up panel thingy that's going to ask users to sign in if they haven't yet. And this is probably something I will want to experiment with to see what works best for driving sign ins. So let's think about how we would want to wire up remote config within this app for maximum A-B testing effectiveness. Well, it looks like there's a bunch of values I might want to tweak later. Obviously, I'll want the ability to change the text of this call to action label, as well as maybe the text of these buttons. This is probably less critical, but I might also want the ability to change colors, both uh, the background color of my view, the color of this label, and maybe the color of these buttons. And then just to be complete, uh, I've also got the content of these two text labels going through remote config, as well as a general label color variable that I'm using to set the colors of all of my other labels. And finally, I'm setting the content of this image through remote config too. Uh, to do that, I'm creating a tiny little object in JSON that specifies if this image is local, and if so, what the local image name is, or remote, and if so, what URL to use. Uh, keep in mind that remote config doesn't support JSON objects natively, but I can certainly send them across as strings and decode it on the client. And in practice, that is what a lot of developers do when they're using remote config. Now, obviously, I could go even further if I wanted, right? Like, in theory, I could probably get every aspect of my app to use remote config, everything from like the font type and size to the exact spacing and layout. But I think for my app, this probably isn't necessary. Uh, but you should decide what makes sense in your particular situation. Now, I don't want to derail this video by getting into all the code that I put into getting the sample app up and running, but honestly, it's nothing too fancy. Uh, however, if you are interested in the implementation details, I'll be making a follow-up video where I walk you through what I did, and you will eventually find that link in the description below. So, I've got my app wired up for remote config, which gives me the ability to change all sorts of aspects about my app later. But I'm not quite ready to run an A-B test yet. I also need to determine whether or not my changes are successful, which means I need to measure what's going on within my app, and for that, I will need some analytics. Now, if you don't know anything about Google Analytics for Firebase, the product formerly known as Firebase Analytics, we also have some videos for you to check out. And if you're only going to watch one, I recommend checking out our video on events because that's primarily what you're going to be dealing with. And uh, yes, I know the video title for it says iOS, but like 90% of the video is applicable to you Android folks too. So go ahead and watch. So Google Analytics for Firebase works by recording events that happen within your app. A number of these are recorded automatically by the SDK, things like in-app purchases or ad clicks, which it can use to determine revenue, as well as events like your user bringing your app into the foreground, which can be used to determine retention and engagement. But you're probably also going to want to record custom events that happen within your app, partly because, well, by recording these events, you can get a better sense overall of how people are interacting with your app, but also because you might want to use some of these custom events as a way of measuring success within your A-B test. See, when you run A-B tests on Firebase, part of running that experiment is telling Firebase what you consider to be a successful outcome. In some cases, it might be earning more money within your app. In other cases, it might be your users spending more time within your app or coming back to it more often. But in other cases, it might be maximizing the occurrence of a specific event. For instance, uh, if you want to see whether a change in your app does a better job of getting your users to complete your in-app tutorial, you probably want to add a tutorial start and a tutorial completed event, and then see if you can maximize the occurrence of that latter event. Uh, if you're messing around with the look and feel of a Save to My Favorites button, you'll probably want to create an Added to Favorites event so you can maximize that. So going back to my sample app, uh, I think I'm going to add a sign-in panel revealed event uh, to record that I am presenting the user with this little panel. But then I will also record a sign-in event when my user is signed in, because that is an event I will probably be interested in maximizing within my experiments. Finally, I'm going to want to make sure I have a fairly recent version of Remote Config installed so that it knows to tell analytics about the experiments it might be running. Uh, that means running pod update on iOS and updating your Gradle file on Android. And you can refer to the documentation for the exact minimum version numbers that you need. So, I am now at the point where I can create an experiment by changing up a whole bunch of parameters within my app through Remote Config. Uh, 
I'm also now able to measure the results of an experiment by going to Google Analytics for Firebase, either by looking at some of the values it's recording automatically or looking at some of my specific events. So I think I'm finally ready to run an experiment for real. And we will look at doing that in the next video. So stay tuned.